The following podcast is a Next Level production. Hey, is everything okay? What the hell, you guys? What kind of stupid finale is this? Uh, we thought it'd be really cool and like unexpected. Yeah, like fun and kind of a kind of a twist. A twist. Yeah. The bad guy steals my blood in order to give himself superpowers. Where did you come up with that original idea? Was that from every other superhero story ever? Okay, there are certain things that are supposed to happen in a superhero story. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Why don't we just do things our own way? This is the story that Kevin wants. Yeah. Okay, then I want to talk to Kevin. Hey, panelists, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this episode of Panels to Pixels podcast, we're going to do a spoiler-full podcast about both The Umbrella Academy Season 3, Episode 6, and She-Hulk Season 1, Episode 9. So, uh, first, we're going to start off with Umbrella Academy Season 3, Episode 6, entitled Marigold. Yeah, so Five chases down Pogo, Victor and Harlan attempt a transfer of powers, and Diego and Lila venture beyond the wall of the White Buffalo Suite. The White Buffalo. The White Buffalo. The White Buffalo. <laughs> I keep hearing that in my head. <laughs> the Buffalo. The White Buffalo. <laughs> uh, so, so what were your thoughts on, on this particular episode? This one was good. Um, I, th- so when I watched it initially, obviously, uh, was whatever several weeks ago or whatever when I watched it for the first time for podcasting. There's a whole bunch that I had forgot, but a lot goes on in this episode, setting up for kind of the rest of the season. Yes, you know. Um, now there's there's other setups that we're going to get later, but there was a bunch of stuff that I had forgotten about that happened in this episode that are pretty significant. Yeah, so it, was, it was exciting to watch it again and then watch it to podcast for it. Yeah, I, I really had a good time with this one in the sense that it, it opened up a lot of doors, a lot of windows, and, and thoughts about where the season was going because there's only so many episodes left that mm-hmm. we do get. And, uh, you know, I love that we get more five. We get Victor and Harlan, uh, Luther and his, his I, I guess, the Sparrows understanding and knowing that, wow, they're together, <laughs> him and Sloan. Yeah, uh, Allison's reveal of uh, what she is going to do because she's taking sides at this point, and she's kind of torn within the episode. And uh, what Harlan actually offers to Victor at this point to to uh, to remedy a lot of the issues that are going on, it, it was like a combination of trying to come together and fix the issues at hand with Victor, but. I think we're a little bit, you know, well, yeah. missed. Like we're wrapping up, we're wrapping, we wrap up one major storyline and we're basically starting kind of the next or that we we wrap up one story arc mm-hmm. and then, and then we're moving into the, the final story arc, which is going to actually be different and not what we thought it was going to be. So, yeah, as well as Klaus. And I love the fact that uh, we, we get that journey of Klaus and uh, yeah, Reginald. we get the beginning of that journey. We get the beginning of that because next episode is when we get the real journey. Oh, which get- I, I I look forward to talking about too because yeah. I just love yeah. the idea of it and what happens within. But but this one, um, we see a different version of Pogo. I love that idea too because mm-hmm. we see in the very beginning. But we'll get into that once we start talking about our highlights. So I think we should start talking about those. Absolutely. Uh, so let's let's kick it off with Pogo. Um, right. With that that tr- that training scene at the beginning, man, Ben just got brutal, yeah. you know, with Jamie uh, <laughs> there, and and but that little he had that smile on his face that just shows how you know, he was looking at their dad, and he he you could see that Reginald was proud of him d- being so brutal, and he kind of gets a smile like he's happy to be brutal, and then she stabs him with that that piece of wood. You yeah. know, uh, and it and just a was, tentacle. <laughs> yeah, and one of the tentacles. And so she she wins the thing and she's like, suck it, you know. <laughs> and, uh, it was it was just great. And we see 
Reginald, you know, after the kids leave, we see Reginald and Pogo together there. And, yes. you know, Reginald admits to not being human because, you know, Pogo says something about, well, you're humanity. And he says, but I'm not, you yes. know, or something, something like that. So it was really interesting to see that and then to, to see Pogo uh, basically get kicked out because, you know, we didn't in the previous seasons that we had Pogo in the, in the first season, he was with the kids their entire lives. Yeah. You yeah. know? Uh, and so, and so we're seeing kind of, and I'll, I'll talk a little more about this later, but we're seeing like what Ben would have turned out if he hadn't died. We're seeing, and we're also seeing what the kid, we, the sparrows are what we're seeing. Of, it would be interesting to see how our other kids would have, would have uh, turned out without the, the, without Pogo there. Yeah. Without Pogo's influence. Right. Yeah. And I think Pogo kept the uh, straight and arrow with the kids and the umbrellas, whereas, with the sparrows, he tried, and we do get a little bit of uh, an awakening of what happened with the sparrows regarding Reginald and how he was treating the sparrows, like Pogo mm -hmm. treating the sparrows, because he was like definitely medicating them, and it it turned against him because the kids later on used that medication to treat Reginald to do whatever they needed. Mm -hmm. Which is wild. Yeah. Well, mine next one would be uh, Fives needing to talk to Pogo. And mm -hmm. I thought it was funny because it, it takes off where we left off, where he just shows up at the biker bar. But he winds up <laughs> hijacking a bike yeah. and, and yeah. following that was, him. <laughs> that was great. That was in my notes, that, that whole thing. So that was really, really cool scene. I thought that was pretty cool in the sense that, you know, he shows up and there's a woman there. And just, there's no Pogo here. Let him in. <laughs> <laughs> and they talk. And I thought that was rad. It was so cool to see five on a bike and on a motorcycle. And they they have that whole conversation about. And then he shows him the skin and he tells him where he got it from. He goes, I never tattooed this, but I know what it's from. And he tells him, and it was something that Hargreaves had, and it was part of his ultimate plan. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, you know, apparently it's all about the Project Oblivion. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and if you think about it, that name alone, Oblivion, I guess that's what's going to happen <laughs> in the end. It's about yeah. Oblivion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we're going to see that because we, we've obviously we've seen it. We don't remember everything, but the, I, I know a little bit. I, I remember some of what is, is going to happen. So, yeah, it's it's interesting just to to hear Pogo kind of lay it out. You mm -hmm. know, we have that moment with him in five where – and what exactly was Pogo's relationship with Chammy? What do you think? Uh, <laughs> I just – you know, I just kind of – it's interesting. Um, well, then, yeah, hey, yeah, who uh, am I to judge? Who am I to judge? I'm not going to uh, judge, but you know, <laughs> I, I, she might, she must love primates. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, it was a cool scene and to hear uh, at least a little bit of the plan, you know, and, and I love that how, how Pogo was looking at it as a magical or supernatural kind of thing. And five is like, no, dad was always scientific. So this has a scientific rationalization. And we know from the end that it's, kind of ends up being a mixture of both in a way of a mixture of science and magic kind of like uh as guardians so yeah yeah especially since well you know reginald is an alien mm -hmm. but there is a bit a lot of magic involved i think to some degree yeah. and yeah. I, well, we won't see i'm pretty sure we won't see anything like that until next season yeah yeah we'll see i mean we, we got like i said we got to see a little bit of it at the end of the season with the guardians and stuff but mm -hmm. uh it's it's gonna be interesting because we we got one of the guardians uh, in this episode. So, yes. uh, so my, my next one is, uh, Victor and Harlan. This, I remember the first time watching this being very confused about what was going on because there was a moment, you know, where Allison, uh, tries to stop Harlan and mm -hmm. she uses the word, I heard a rumor and he doesn't stop, but then she's able to do that, forcing it without saying, you know, the rumor line to him. Yeah. Uh, it's been exposing later, more of her power. That right, she but, didn't even know and she realized that she had. Right, right. But then later, when the actual transfer of power happens, there was a moment there where I was thinking, is he trying to steal her power? Or is he really giving her back the power that she gave him? And, of course, it turns out that's what it was. that Because he comes out of the the little, whatever that 
bubble. Yeah, the drive through, the drive through, <laughs> the drive through rubber fast food restaurant place. He comes out of there and he says that uh, he's sleeping. And then we get more, and we'll talk some more about Allison. But yeah, but yeah, it just was a little bit. It was a little bit confusing to me. Um, but we we definitely get that confirmation that that uh, Victor got his power back. We haven't we haven't we don't see Victor the rest of the episode because it's not until the next episode he's going to find out what Allison did. Exactly. But, but yeah, that was it was just a little confusing to me. And then of course we, we'll talk some more about Harlan well, and Allison. Let, let's talk about the uh, the transference, as it were, uh, from the power of Victor and Harlan. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, it was a drive-in movie. And it was a drive-in movie, uh, like where, you know, uh, the snack shack, as it were. Right. And that's where he was coming out of. Now, you know, you could tell Harlan was very much interested in, interested in giving Victor back the power that Harlan had, uh, gained from the sixties. Mm-hmm. And he didn't want it. It's kind of like he could have it all. And, you know, and then Allison was being very protective and, concerned and thinking that harlan was a villain and that that was why she was like against it and trying to use her power but then later that what i'm saying is yeah that happened first and then later they actually do the transference of power yeah they do it's and it's amazing too with like both of them rising up in the middle of Mm -hmm. the night and the transference of power and energy and it's something to be held but the fact that it was done within and it just give me um it gave me feels of Back to the Future because, oh, Back to the Future Three, I should say, where everything was at a drive-in movie theater. <laughs> so uh, I thought it was pretty cool, but yeah, I, and and you could tell that it was done. Do I not so remember Back to the Future Three? Back to the Future Three was the Wild West one. Yeah, but in the very beginning, how did he go back to the future? Uh, back in the past, he was actually at a drive-in movie theater that was abandoned. Okay, it's very been a while since I watched that. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's been a while since I watched that, so it's that's fine. Yeah, but you know, to me, it, it gave me those vibes in a sense. Hmm. Uh, okay. well, maybe a little bit of uh, you know Christine from Stephen King too. <laughs> but uh, okay, uh, but the uh, to me, it was it was very opening and very understanding about Harlan and Allison's still. It, it, it's her. Uh, she she just doesn't trust anybody. She doesn't trust Harlan, and she wants to believe in Victor. Mm-hmm. And we do see that at the very end too, when she walks into the Sparrow Academy's uh, house. And no, she never went inside. She just stood outside the car. She was she just shows, by, She but, just gives them Harlan's body, and she walks away. Yeah, she doesn't go inside the house. She just walks away. Oh, all right. I thought she just she, she just it, which was that was strange to me too because she lifts up the trunk lid. And apparently, there were two cars. I don't know how many cars the hotel Oblivion has. That they can just give their people to drive, but I guess um, because they're they're because you know Victor's in a car and Allison's in a car, and now Allison takes one of the cars and it's got uh, Harlan's body in the trunk, which she shows to the sparrows, and she's like, "Okay, this is over," and then she just walks away and leaves the car there, and I'm like. You know, she looks at Victor and she just kind of scoffs at Victor wearing that sparrow uniform. Wow. And so Victor or but, Luther? Luther, I'm sorry, Luther wearing yeah. the, the the sparrow uniform. Sorry. Which is an interesting uh side story too, in a set in the sense that uh they do find out about Luther and Sloan. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I love how Fee goes, Yeah, uh we have thin walls here. I could hear the bed squeak. <laughs> yeah, no, I had it. That was that was one of my quotes. That was one of my my quotes. Actually, yeah, yeah. We share a, we share a wall, and your bed squeaks kept me up all night. So yeah, it was it was good. That was a good line. And, and I just love how you know the relationship has grown, but mm-hmm. the fact that the the sparrows want to invite Luther in as one of their own as family. Yeah. I'm I'm I don't remember how that plays out eventually. I, I think he ends up not joining them. No, he because, doesn't. Uh, because as, then from they what I remember, working, yeah, they end up working together to try to get rid of the Kugel Blitz, and it's a whole. Yeah, I I didn't I didn't get that there because Ben says he's got a you know what they is kind of like what are you doing? He's like I got a plan, and but we never know what the I don't think we ever do find out. What I don't, the plan, yeah, we don't <laughs> what the plan was for Luther. I don't know. No, no, Luther uh, Luther is like. We all know 
he's not the greatest mm-hmm. of leaders. He's yeah. uh, he doesn't know what's <laughs> going on half the time with his own family. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of which that I, I like too, because you don't see that much interaction between uh, Lila Diego and the other siblings that are out there. And yeah, no, they had their separate storyline. This they're, they're on this separate. Episode. Yeah, they're looking for Stan, and we know Stan's gone. Yeah. And that was my next point. Actually, was Di- 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 Diego, Diego, Lila, and the other side. Um, you know, I thought it was interesting. They go looking for Stanley through this thing, and they find his lighter there at the door. And Diego mm-hmm. says something like, "Of course, he's a twelve-year-old kid. He's going to go through the mysterious tunnel." And I'm like, "I don't like. I don't really follow that logic, but okay." Um, yeah, it's called <laughs> kids just being kids and being snoopy. Yeah. You know. Um, you know, eventually when they're on the other side, Lila tells him the truth that Stanley is not his son, that she basically kidnapped him from the 1980s and, <laughs> and brought him here. And he's like, you kidnapped a kid? <laughs> you know. And, uh, and this was the part where I had forgotten a whole lot of this part of the storyline. I totally forgot that he got his fingers chopped off. Um, totally forgot. And I think I gasped every time. When that moment happened, because it's what, just Diego so getting his cho- yeah, yeah, Diego got his fingers chopped off. I had totally forgotten about that. So when it happened the first time watching this for this podcast, I was like, "Whoa!" I was startled. And then when it happened again, again, it just startled me because it was just one of those things that it just comes out of the blue, you know? Yeah, because his hands are so important to him. And then they they run out, they they get out, they get out of the building, or they get back to the other oblivion hotel and they get the door closed and i thought it was interesting that the the guardian kind of pounded on the door a few times and when he couldn't get it to open it seems like he just turns around and walks away and i was like that doesn't make any sense if he's either going to pursue him or he's not going to pursue him but whatever i think that gets answered somewhat in the last episode so we'll probably talk more about them but then of course we see that stanley had just gone out to get a slushy and a slim jim <laughs> and uh and but then he gets blitzed uh yeah, there with the Kugel with the Kugel Blitz. So yeah, that whole storyline was was completely separate, and and we're going to learn more about this as the the rest of the episodes progress. But but yeah, this is this is going to be interesting to see to to remember how uh, Diego and Lila deal with this. And I know there's another reveal uh, that Lila is going to give that she hasn't given yet. Yeah, yeah, there, there's definitely a big, huge one, but we're not going to mm-hmm. get that until probably next episode. It's either eight or it's either seven or yeah, it's it's down the road. It's, it's, I definitely by eight we know what's going yeah. on, and okay. I, that I remember. But we're gonna go this episodically, people. So right. uh, keep <laughs> listening as you are, if you're still mm-hmm. listening. That is, but obviously we're gonna get to She Hulk episode nine, the finale. But uh, right now we're talking about the uh, the Umbrella Academy season three, episode six. But yeah, I. Uh, the, a lot of what I had was bait I already spoke about. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one big true giveaway was oh, Hargreaves and how the Sparrows treated him. Because literally all the pills that Pogo gave them over the years. That was like a rude awakening to me. I'm like, oh, that's why. That's mm-hmm. how they're drugging him. Because he was drugging the kids to deal with Reginald. And when he left, they took a side and said, all right, we're going to give these to him. Mm-hmm. Now he's a TJ Hooker fan stuck to the TV. Yeah, but he's starting to get his mind back. That's what he Five tells, tells Pogo. He said, yeah, my brother taught him how to, how to, not, uh, how to fool him. So he's going to start to get his mind back a little bit. And we're going to see, especially in the next episode, I think he completely gets his mind back. Oh, he does. Uh, but he's mm-hmm. still in the sense of trying to show Klaus the way. <laughs> And that that to me is like that was one of my favorite episodes out of the season too. Is like to see yeah. Klaus and Hargreaves on their journey and what he has to do. And mm-hmm. uh, that's next episode now. So that's, yeah, that's yeah, it's next yet. episode. I know we're not there yet, <laughs> but uh, to me that was my favorite episode. I look forward to actually talking about yeah. that. But yeah, uh, uh, that was about it for me with all my points and everything. Okay. Uh, the one thing I did want to bring up that was in my notes. We do see the Buffalo painting within Hargreaves' room this time, as Klaus and Reginald argue. Mm-hmm. We've seen it before too, though. It's, yeah, it's, it's been yeah. it's been foreshadowed before. But now is when Hargreaves finally hears that that Klaus knows about the Buffalo room. So yeah, that was great. I love that the logo cha- actually changed on the door when when Pogo closed the door instead of getting two the two logos like side by side. Yeah, it changes from the Sparrow to the Umbrella Academy. I thought that was that was a cool 
little effect there. Yeah, it um, was like a turning of power, uh, literally, of how the episode was turning about, because Sparrows don't have the upper hand at this point. Now the Umbrella Academy does. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. I loved Luther in having his conversation with uh, Sparrow Ben because it was so, you know, Ben has been trying to understand why do you guys keep talking about this other Ben? And so finally Luther admits, hey, he was the best of us. But again, like I said at the beginning, we're seeing a Ben that we're seeing a different Ben anyway. So it's it's going to be Ben. Yeah. 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 So I I, I just thought it was interesting that that whole conversation that he has where he's like, I'll take whatever I can get of of this bin, you know, Mm -hmm. and so that was a really, really cool moment between the two of them. Um, I'm looking, I think, yeah, I think that's everything. I've got one more quote that uh, I haven't shared yet from the the episode um, for the Umbrella Academy. And that's uh, the one with Luther when he's talking to to Sloan and he's talking about his family. He says, the only thing we really have in common is childhood trauma. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the only quote that I would have would be Harlan saying everyone has their own vibration. That's when Allison asked mm-hmm. of what he is listening to, to to his headphones. But he, he mentions that, you know, because she kind of mocked what he was listening to, which was like water or something of uh, ocean mm-hmm. or something. But yeah, and then uh, there was one from Luther to Ben saying, genetically, you are the same person. And Ben goes, great, the old nature versus nurture speech mm-hmm. about you know, trying to reach through to the Ben that we're seeing. Then they offer Luther, a, you know, the Sparrow's uniform. And then, yeah. he, you know, Luther just has that look of shock on his face going, what? And then, uh, you know, and the thing about Ben, honestly, uh, within this episode I, you know, we, you and I just did the um, community episode on Wilhelm. Mm-hmm. Now, remember uh, with with uh, Jeff when he flips the dice and they mm-hmm. had like alternate timelines. Mm-hmm. It's like that to me. It's like this is the alternate timeline of Ben. I'm yeah. not saying he's truly evil, but the fact is, is that it's a completely different Ben, and the Umbrella Academy doesn't understand it. Or right. see it because all they see is Ben, but mm-hmm. in community they all knew, and then they encountered each other, and you know that that was an interesting thing. To me, it, it's kind of a weird thing though that you're encountering these people, and then they can't come to the terms of this is a completely different person, mm-hmm. and they're just not dealing with it correctly. But yeah, yeah I I do enjoy the uh, how they're trying to reason and rationalize. And trying to make this Ben like their Ben. But yeah. I think at the very end of the season, we do see uh, them come to a compromise of like accepting this Ben for who he is. And he's, yeah, a I don't bit remember changed. exactly how it, I don't remember how it turns out. Oh, there was one other thing that I had that we didn't talk about. Okay. Was part of Allison's journey is that she mentions the fact that she looked up Ray's death when she's talking to that kind of hallucination mm. of him. And she says she looked up. She said the the Ray I knew died nine years ago or whatever it was. Uh, and and you know he lived a full and, ha- and happy life or something like that. And the guy says, yeah, but it was. Or she said, but it was without me. And that's what we see when as soon as she encounters Harlan outside of that drive-in, you know, snack shack. When Harlan admits to her what he did, that he was the one that that killed their mothers. She just snaps, you know. And I love it. Ray had a line in there where he says, we all go a, a little crazy sometimes. He did the, he kind of, similar to the psycho. I mean, I think it's mad or uh, it's crazy. He he says crazy, but in the in psycho, uh, he says mad. He says, we all yeah. go a little mad sometimes. So a little different line, but still definitely a homage to the psycho it does. line there that I thought, was, I thought was great. But yeah, we're seeing, again, this progression of Allison's of where she just flat out murders Harlan. Yeah, you know, and throws him in the trunk of the car, and that ends that storyline. Okay, we're done, and we're going to see how that plays out when Victor finds out what she did. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's like a big mm-hmm. change in relationship at that point, too. Yeah, yeah that 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 was our coverage for Umbrella Academy season three, episode six. So if you guys have any thoughts or anything, you know, you know the deal. Just put them in the comments below in Facebook or uh, send an email, and we'll uh, bring them up. Absolutely. Next up, uh, well, we're going to be talking about She-Hulk, Attorney at Law, Season 1, Episode 9. Whose show is this? (laughs) 
So good. Jin finds herself in trouble with the law and struggles to pick up the pieces of her life. Okay, kind of. That's that's a good. I guess that's a good synopsis of the show. Yeah, the but maybe she flipped a few pages and talked to the editorial room. And <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I absolutely love this one. Uh, really, I, I was. I I did. I was so excited. I even sent a, a voicemail to Podcastica's uh, She Hulk cast for their coverage. Uh, it just for me, the episode had everything that that we would have wanted that I, I or that I wanted anyway. Um, so I, I can't wait for us to kind of talk, talk through it. Mm-hmm. I, I will, I will admit one thing. I was obviously, I was wrong last week. The whole Hulk underscore King thing was a name. It was, that was the name Todd was using was Hulk King. <laughs> that is I was true. wrong. I was wrong in that, in that, but no, I loved it, man. I, I wish I, I only had the chance to watch it twice. I'm definitely going to be watching it again because it's so good. And there's just so much stuff in it. But I have one, there's one concern I have of a line that was said that I'm worried about for if there is a second season. I still mm-hmm. hope there's going to be a second season, but uh, we'll talk about that when we they get into They talk our notes. about that within the episode. Yeah. They do. They do. But what do you, what do you think? What did you think? I thought it was interesting as an episode. I, I liked it. But confused mm-hmm. throughout it, but then again, uh, anytime you read a She-Hulk comic book, you're going to get confused with all the fourth wall breaks. And mm-hmm. this one, there was a ton. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, and, so and, and, it, and she just basically rips the episode in half at the very end and goes yeah. on a tirade. But it was something that was needed. It's nothing different from the comic. So those of you listeners that are only just watching the show and have never read a comic... This is literally what she does within the comic every once in a while. It doesn't happen every issue all the time. You know, there'll be certain panels, and then she'll rip it, and then she'll change it, scream at John Byrne or whoever's writing at that time, and then somebody will be the voice of reason in the panel itself as she's ripping it, and you go down to the next one, and then it just continues on. Mm -hmm. This one was a whole ripping and changing and just literally taking straight from the comic to the pixel. So the panel to the pixel in a sense and making it as, you know, honestly, uh, I had a conversation with somebody and they didn't believe me when I said, look, she Hulk was the first person other than Deadpool to break that fourth wall in the comics. And it is the truth because mm-hmm. it started with the burn run. That was long before Layfield actually got involved with, uh, with, with Deadpool. Nice. And and that's the whole thing. And a lot of people ignored that over the years. And they always say, oh, oh, Deadpool was, oh, he breaks the fourth wall. And when you bring up She-Hulk, they, they're like, no. And they kind of dismiss it. Nope. Th- this was the mm-hmm. first. But to me, it kind of got confusing. But after a couple of watches or a few watches at that point, I started to realize, and I'm like, okay, I, I see the humor in it, but you had to watch it. But to me, I enjoyed it. it. It took me a while, but I'm thinking a lot of people are giving it really bad reviews. In my opinion, huh. I don't care. <laughs> I liked it. Uh, yeah, like I said, I loved it. I I was absolutely, yeah. It had everything to me. It had everything that I I would have wanted. I mean, maybe the only thing we didn't really get was any courtroom stuff. Yeah. yeah, well, uh, slightly uh, with Nikki and maybe Pug coming in and right with them delivering the plea deal to her, and then at the end, her whole closing argument thing was really great. Turning that around on on the K E V I N uh, was was really cool. And he's like, "I see what you did there. Okay, I'll allow it." You know, <laughs> was really really cool. I, I I just yeah, I just I like I said, I really liked it. I so many things. There's I've got bullet points because I was. Uh, uh, been dealing with this nerve issue and it was hard for me to type today but yeah i loved it loved it absolutely yeah with that we'll move right along into our top thoughts uh i'll start it this time absolutely yeah um honestly yeah i I just love that whole intro and i've been waiting for this all season because we were teased with it all through uh the advertising for she hulk when it first was announced yeah, Ruffalo and uh, Tatiana Maslany as uh, uh, like pictured like banner with Big Speed's banner and uh, okay, so his- that was Ruffalo. That was Ruffalo when she says the line about "Don't you don't like me when I'm angry." 
that yeah. was that was Ruffalo. I thought it was. I didn't have a chance to check the credits. So that was cool. I was like, that really looks like Mark Ruffalo. But I don't know if, if it's for sure is him. That but was. I, yeah. 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 Great. And then it, it was supposed to be Mr. McGee and, you know, Batter when mm-hmm. they had that whole thing interaction because it was taken straight out of the 70s and 80s. Incredible TV Hulk's, show. Yeah. The Incredible yeah, TV, Hulk TV show with Bigsby and Ferrigno. And mm-hmm. I've been looking forward to, but they went through the whole intro, which was amazing. I and, loved it. I loved. It. I loved the tweaks they did to it yeah. for Shield and, and stuff. But go ahead. I'll, you you talk. This is one of my points as well. So you talk your out yours, and I'll I'll throw in mine when you're done. Well, I just no no. I I just love the whole intro as it were, and that, yeah. that's it. That, that's all I had yeah. to say about it. To me, I've been looking forward to it. I'm so glad. But they did the whole thing complete with their own little bit of twist. But mm-hmm. if you do shot for shot for most part, it's exactly like. That Bixby for Igno show. Yeah, I love the and I love the split screen at the end, just like it did at the end of those credits showing Bixby and Frigno. This one shows, you know, Jim Walters and or Sir Tatiana Lottie and then the She-Hulk and their in that kind of split screen thing yep. was just, What's just terrific. Roar? That ah. yeah, that whole thing was just <laughs> I just absolutely loved that opening. It's it's just so good. That opening is so great, and it was something that I was so dying for because you know, mm-hmm. as cheesy as the Bigsby for Igno show was when it was out and he, for people that are, are our age that look back at it, a lot of people hate it. But to me, I still love it for the nostalgia of it because of when I was a kid, because I, I enjoyed it yeah. as I, yeah. I, I and that music, that every haunting week music. to watch that show. Yeah. <laughs> that haunting music that it always had that, be- I think it's a Beethoven Oh no no! It's not that's the, no, it's the Lonely Man theme. Oh okay. Do, 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 do. Yeah, that one. Okay. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, that's so good. So good. My first one is uh, it's it's kind of a quick one, but that video they had of college age Jen and she's in the dreadlocks. Uh, I <laughs> she's absolutely twerking. I, and she's twerking. Yeah, it was great. But it also that dreadlocked kind of with the glasses was very much. Uh, I think was a homage to Orphan Black. Because there's one of the one of the clones in Orphan Black dresses with dreadlocks and has glasses ah. and was like at a university kind of thing. So I, I think that was definitely a homage to her Orph- Orphan Black, which is pretty date. cool. I, I, yeah. If that's the truth, that'd be good. If you listeners have a, a thought about that and you know for definitely sure, if it was just coincidental, then it was really highly coincidental. But it, it, it was, really, yeah. It really looks like that that clone character that she played. Yeah, let us know. Let us know your thoughts. Well, in the very beginning, Jen complies with that plea deal since the attack that she mm-hmm. had at the gala. So she stuck with her mom and her dad. Yeah. And she lost her job with the firm. Mm-hmm. And then she has to wear this inhibitor just like Emil does. Yeah. So what the abomination does at, and his place. So she's stuck there. You got Nikki and her. They're, they're doing this NYPD blue profiler thing where they're trying to find a source of intelligentsia and trying to figure out who's to blame. Yeah. And, you know, it, and, and love, you can I, tell that Nikki's backing her up. Yeah. I love Nikki's line when they're, when they're taking all of her stuff out of, out of the, the, the law offices and she goes, I'm going to keep working here because they pay me nicely. I yeah. thought that was just, just <laughs> so Nikki. She's like, I'm not, by the way, I'm not quitting my job for you, but you know, <laughs> they pay me nicely. Uh, so I thought that was really, really great. And, you know, just that her, her and Pug uh, working together and then her like realizing that she's going to have to get a man to go to undercover in this intelligentsia thing is like, she's like, Pug, are you still here? <laughs> so, <it> was <laughs> well, just it, I think it was really cool for the fact that Pug went along with it with Nikki and mm-hmm. helping out Jen. Yeah. And I'm loving that idea. It shows that. They're really good friends. Mm-hmm. And Pug is there. He's not the tool that you think he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially when we see him when he goes into the intelligentsia. So that is something I love to talk about, too, because he gets in there and there's there's a few things that they talk about. Actually, they bring it into canon about with Thor, Love and Thunder, because they talk about Lady Thor. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then they talk about, you know, because in comparison to She-Hulk and and everything else. So apparently this is around that time. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. And again, the same kind of comments that you're getting that I'm sure were real comments. They had probably seen on the tweets and stuff was, was really, really hilarious. I love the fact that he just didn't, he couldn't stand being in there. You could just see the disgust yeah. on his face. You know, he's like, should I really wear this earpiece? And she's like, trust me, you won't be the only one wearing an earpiece. I, that is, that is one of the things for me 
that I absolutely hate when I do have one in and I'm trying to interact with other people. I usually try to, I try to take it out. So it's not in my ear when I'm, when I'm talking to somebody, you yeah. know, in, in actual person. Cause I just think that's just a, uh, I, I, I don't want to get on a diatribe about that. Um, <laughs> I loved that, uh, that Bruce is smug Hulk in her, in her cell phone. I had to pause it to see when she's texting. <laughs> he's smug Hulk is what she calls him. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, uh, I, I, I kind of got that feeling that she was going to put that in her cell phone anyway. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love the fact that during that whole thing where uh, Pug infiltrates, uh, at first, when I saw all the signs, I'm like, wait, they're in Emil's complex. And yeah, I, I, I didn't even pick right up away. on it. I, yeah, I didn't even pick up on it until until the, the guy that attacked her in the earlier episode, who apparently had no idea this was going on, uh, yeah. told her, oh, he's at some private event. It wasn't until un- until he said he's at some private event mm-hmm. that I went, oh, it's the same place. He's one of the bad guys. So, mm-hmm. But but yeah, I didn't catch it when Pug first went in there. I, I It didn't even dawn on me seeing the signs in the back and stuff. Yeah, so apparently Emil rents out his place for uh, other people for gatherings. <laughs> and he's a motivational life coach. And yeah, like, yeah, and I- he was trying <laughs> to do the... He was Honestly, he was just trying to be nice about it and help help others with their issues too, with their own little gathering. And he didn't, you know, Emma was, uh, it wasn't, it yeah, wasn't, it wasn't intentionally it, to the point of like, he was doing bad. Of he hurting was just Jim, tra- right. Yeah. Right. He was trying to I be helpful. Yeah. It wasn't until the second watch that I picked up on that. I don't think he was really intentionally, he didn't, he, he wasn't thinking about the fact that he was intention that they were hurting Jen. And so him by he, he by extension was hurting Jen. Mm-hmm. By, by even siding with them at all. Yeah. You know, and, and so w- the, that he figured that out when Todd hulks out and starts to attack her. And oh, so he God. grabs her <laughs> and gets her out of the way and he saves her. And then we have that whole interaction between him and Hulk, yeah. you know, where Hulk thinks he's attacking, uh, Jen. And, uh, th- of course, that's when Jen stops everything. Yeah. Uh, it, and he's it's like, like, wait a minute. Ends it. Wait a minute. <laughs> this is too messy. Why are we doing this so messy? I loved. That when she breaks it, when the, the thing pauses and she breaks the screen, she looks through, she has to scroll through like the Disney plus app and yep. she's looking, she's looking for, <laughs> no, can't use that one. Can't, and she sees, oh, Marvel's a sim, Marvel's a symbol. That's one that I can use. Cause that's one that actually goes like into the writer's room and yep. into production type stuff. So she opens up the Marvel's assembled one and crawls in there and she's on the back lot, <laughs> you know, at the studio. I thought it was just great. Well, the whole backlot thing was pretty cool. Uh, I love the fact that we got Todd. He, he exposes himself as the Hulk King, mm-hmm. just to make it apparent. But the fact that he turns into bro dude Hulk, and then we got, uh, you know, Bruce shows up, and that's really what spawns about it, especially when Titania actually shows up. Yeah. yeah and Chin's like, wait a minute, Titania's here? How is she? This is just getting so messy. It you is know? messy to the point where it's like, this doesn't make any sense. And that's why she decides, oh, I'm going to go after the writer's room. All right, guys. <laughs> and that's what we've been talking about this whole season. We've been waiting for her to interact with the writers. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, it took until the very last episode to do so, which mm-hmm. I, I honestly, they should have done it sooner. Like in the beginning. Or, Once, you know, they could have given us a mid. piece, yeah, do a mini one, give us a piece of her stepping into production, maybe just so it wasn't so jarring. I can see how it might have been jarring to some people for it to happen in this. And it gets confusing to them because they're not familiar. And, you know, that that was the only thing. But honestly, I, I thought it was uh, pretty cool that we get that. And mm-hmm. it's straight out of the comic. But the, the whole last half of it literally is her breaking that fourth wall and dealing mm-hmm. with it. And, uh, you know, it, the one thing that I love too, is that I need to speak to Kevin. Now you're thinking Kevin Feige. Nope. It's Kevin K E V I N knowledge, enhanced visual interconnectivity nexus. Yeah. And this is my only point of a little bit of criticism there. Cause she says, I want to speak to Kevin. And in the subtitles, when they say the name back to her, mm-hmm. the subtitles put it as an acronym, K-E-V-I-N. Yeah. And I and I think that revealed, I think they shouldn't have done that in the subtitles because that's acting like everybody knows, I guess, because that's why, I guess that's why the guy had her sign that NDA because yep. everybody knows that he's actually a robot and Kevin Feige isn't a real person, you know, or <laughs> the, 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 they, everybody knows that, but still it, it revealed to the audience 
what was going on because of the subtitles. Well, the subtitles, but if you didn't have subtitles on, right? That's you that's what know. I'm saying. That's yeah. that's what I'm. That's exactly what I'm saying. But yeah, because because people that have subtitles on, we were spoiled at the reveal because yeah. I'm like, wait a minute, K E V I N. That's an acronym. What is he? Some sort of robot or something? And so it, that's the only part that really kind of bothered me was I wish they hadn't done that in the subtitles. Yeah, Disney, take a note, please do not put spoilers and acronyms. Well, and this is the subtitles. other thing. This is the other thing that I was a little critical of the episode is is he he says something to her like you won't be able to interact with with Kevin again. We fixed that part of the algorithm, and so yeah. I hope I hope that doesn't mean she's no longer going to break the fourth wall. I hope it just means she's never going to crawl out of the TV again. I hope I hope that's what it means. I hope because if we get a season two and we don't get her talking to the audience, that's just going to be a shame. I don't think that's going to happen at all. Okay. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if we do get a second season, because we haven't really got any comp- true confirmation yet. Mm-hmm. But if we do, I wouldn't be surprised if she destroys Kevin. And then, <laughs> she, you know, think about it. it. It could be the first episode where she finds the real Kevin Feige and destroys the machine. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. But like I said, he, he said you won't be able to interact. So I don't know. She'll have to fix that somehow. Yeah, she'll fix the glitch. <laughs> yeah. I just love how when Kevin says that she is very expensive and has to transform back to Jennifer. <laughs> that was great. That's a great. The visual effects team has moved on to another project. <laughs> yeah. Which talks great. about how much it costs to actually do these things. Yeah. She talks about the super soldier serum plot at the end of her show. Yeah. And yeah. that was also something that we'll get into when we talk about uh, Werewolf by Night, because that was also a subplot within the comics, but we'll talk about that. I love how she changes the story ending overall. Wanting yeah. to have Daredevil because he was hot. <laughs> I know. A girl's got her needs. I thought that was just great. And and then he says, that's when the, the computer Kevin says something like, well, we won't see you. We'll see you in the movies. And she's like, really? And he's like, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just like, oh. <laughs> so, yeah. And then, then we get that cool thing where she starts to break things down like, then she talks about the daddy issues with Cap, Loki, Thor, Star yeah. Lord with two daddies and two issues. Yeah. She's like, everybody's all these all these things. Can we do something different from my show? And he's like, it's not your show, it's Kevin's show. And no, it's Shield show. Yep. So. <laughs> and then she asks about when are we gonna get the X-Men? Gives two thumbs up and a wink with a tongue sticking out at the camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And Kevin can't say anything she asks about season two of She-Hulk. We don't get a really full disclosure about what's going no, on. No, we get the writer. We get When she breaks in the writer's room, I think you alluded to this earlier. She breaks in the writer's room. They're kind of discussing options for season two. Yeah. And like one of the one of them is, it could be a dream. It could be all the dream sequence or something like that. And I'm like, what? Uh, come on. So, but yeah, it, it's, I hope, I hope we get a season two because I, I really did enjoy it. Same here, and they could always add more to it because you could get more. Uh, what what they seem to be doing is introducing a lot of characters into these shows that the movies won't normally typically do, and then right. with that we can move right along into the ending, which was pretty funny because you got Daredevil showing up at Jen's family I, picnic, at the barbe- yeah, the family barbecue, and her dad's asking him all. The- so you have your own firm, and and he's like, yeah, it's in Hell's Kitchen. I work with disadvantaged. Oh, so you don't make a lot of money. So- yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then and she's like, she kind of sidelines it. And he goes, what did you set me up for? <laughs> like, and I wonder, that was an interesting kind of side plot that maybe they're just going to kind of kind of hush hush it is if they know that She-Hulk is with Daredevil and that this guy is coming around, are they going to figure out that he's, you see what I'm saying? You see, it's yeah, a little bit of a, yeah, but, it's a little bit of a, a, a tough thing that maybe her family can be sworn to secrecy or, or something. I don't know. I just, uh, it's, it's probably a throwaway kind of thing that we're not. I think it was have kind of a throwaway with. thing. Cause she kept saying, dad, mom, dad, no, he's only here for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah. Cause he's going to go back. He's going to go back East and have his own show and everything. And so yeah. that's uh, so yeah, we probably won't get a lot of interactions between them, but maybe we will. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Because you know, Pug and Pug and uh, Nikki kind of figured it out. Because or Pug figured it out. He goes, "Wait, did they hook up? Are they a thing?" <laughs> and, and Nikki's like, "Shh." So yeah, Pug knows now because <laughs> yeah. yeah. so Nikki knew. <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to to, to see uh, like going forward what the 
Uh, but yeah, that was a fun that was a fun scene there at the end. You know, take care of the burgers and yeah, and it, we kind of uh, missed out on it just talking about Emil goes to jail, but he does admit that you know he has some issues, and then uh, mm-hmm. he kind of did wrong. He did you know abomination out. <laughs> and he wasn't supposed to, so he kind mm-hmm. of. Uh, but then he takes up Wong on his on his offer to live at Carmitage. Yeah. So yep. so we are going to get the abomination in the future. We can still get a Thunderbolts. You know, oh, yeah, uh, definitely. Kind of thing. So we'll we'll have to see if that happens in the future or not. But uh, yeah, that was great. I, I love what did Tim, what did uh, Emil say? Something like, "Well, you took your time," or or something like that. Yeah. And- yeah, and Wong's like, "Oh, he, I was dealing with something else," and which uh, we're gonna find out later on, probably. <laughs> well, and then I'm sure you have something to say about the really big reveal. Oh yeah, the big reveal when Bruce shows up with mm-hmm. his son Scar. Yeah. So yeah, because uh, you've been talking about that all season. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right. So, uh, listeners, those of you who are not comic fans, I will bring this up and I will give the story out quickly. Well. There was a comic run, and you all know Thor Ragnarok. And we already know that story plot where he went to Sakaar. It was a battle zone where we used set to be a warrior. Well, in the original comics, basically, the Illuminati thought the Hulk was so savage to the point where they had to banish him. So they sent him out into space with his spaceship, and he was banished from Earth because he caused so much trouble, chaos, damage, and and caused a lot of deaths. So the, the Illuminati sends him out. He gets stuck on Sakaar. He winds up building through the ranks like we saw in the Age of Ragnarok with Thor, and uh, just like that movie. So he was like a warrior. He winds up falling in love, taking over, and marrying a queen and having children. And then the story rolls around where uh, he's summoned back. He goes back to Earth for some reason. I'm not going to get into it. But he finds out something happened to his wife. His wife's dead, thinks his son is dead, and we get World War Hulk, which is literally he just goes crazy and tries to kill the Marvel Universe. But in this case, we don't get any of that. We just get Scar coming back to Earth. So... There's a whole hidden storyline within the MC, MCU right now because Bruce went there as Smart Hulk and got mm-hmm. his son and brought him back to Earth. Yeah, so that, that's going to be something we're going to see in a future movie or TV yeah, show or something. Yeah, and so. the cool thing about Scar and his powers is he could go back to human form, which is like a little kid, mm. but he's a kid. And uh, I, the only thing I didn't like was his haircut because his hairline was like way back, like shaved. That's not the scar I know, but uh, he has powers like his mom, and his mom has specific powers, so my re- recommendation, do your homework and go read those comics. They're out there in trade paperback. But he has, uh, he can't Hulk out and get like stronger like Hulk does when he Hulk, you know, he turns green. He has str- superhuman strength, but he's not as strong as the Hulk, but he also has Yeah, and that's all stuff power. we'll find out. Yeah, that's yeah, all stuff, that stuff we'll find out later on. And they can change it if they want. So. And they could change it, too, because these are adaptations. But it's pretty cool that he brings up, and then they all just accept Scar for who he is at the, yeah. at the barbecue. And I thought that was, was pretty cool. I was waiting for Jen to turn to the audience and say something like, is he hijacking my show? Is Mike getting hijacked again or something <laughs> like that? But we had had enough. We had enough fourth wall breaks, so I think that's, yeah. that's good. I know we're a lot more in this episode than any other that we've had before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's all I had. Okay. The only quote I have is from Jin's dad when he's <laughs> spraying the reporters. He says, get off my damn lawn. I don't care if there's a drought. I got water pressure for days. <laughs> it was so good to see Mark Lynn Baker in something. Oh, yeah. I have one from uh, Jen. And it's when she decides to go to see Emil and, and his retreat. Mm-hmm. She goes, I'm not running from my problems. It's a mental health break. And that's to us, the audience. Yeah, that's great. Todd saying, Mother Pugger, when he sees Pug at the Intelligentsia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course you're one of us, dude. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, that one character, I'm forgetting the character's name, who is in the Wrecking Crew that Jen befriended within the, mm-hmm. the group. 
Yeah, and, I can't remember his name either. Yeah, uh, the guy I met at uh, Walker Stalker. Uh, he goes, hmm, I kind of missed the chicken blood. And that was with the tea and everything that he was making at night in the kitchen. When for- oh, I didn't catch that one because he told Jen to watch out when Saracen makes it because he might put blood in it. Yep, so that's- but he was like, yeah, I kind of missed the chicken blood. <laughs> hmm, okay. I, I didn't catch that one, so interesting. And then one last one I have is what Jen states uh, to Kevin, or K-E-V-I-N, saying, yeah, that's what Hulks do. We smash things. Bruce smashes buildings. I smash fourth walls and bad endings. And sometimes Matt Murdock and then winks <laughs> at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah, that was a good one. But uh, yeah, that, that, that was, uh, those are my thoughts and uh, on our coverage on that. We can move right along into some news. We got some interesting news. Okay. Now, mind you, it, it's not a hundred percent, but it is definite that Harrison Ford is in talks with the MCU. Okay. He is going to be Thaddeus Ross in the next Captain America movie. Thaddeus so, Ross. Thaddeus Ross. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's going to. Oh, pl- is that is that the part? Wait. That was William Hurt's character. William Hurt's character. Okay, so they're changing actors. With well, okay. not changing. William Hurt passed away during right. his oh, time. Right, right. I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, they they he's going to take over the role. He's going to take over the role now. Okay. Does this mean we're going to have Harrison Ford as the Red Hulk and the uh, Thunderbolts? I do not know, but somebody actually uh, one of the heads of Marvel was on the Rocco Report, Roca, I should say, the Roca Report, and he's very well known in the media. And it was on YouTube, and the guy mentioned, he goes, yeah, it's definite that Harrison Ford is signed up for the next Captain America movie and uh, with Anthony Mackie and uh, the Winter Soldier himself, Sebastian Stan. So Harrison Ford is going to be taking up the mantle of uh, Thaddeus Ross, but when Roca had asked him about uh, being Red Hulk, he goes, well... We have to get through this one first. So basically, if Harrison Ford signs on for more films, then we'll get most likely get him as Red Hulk. Not that Mr. Harrison Ford himself has to do anything, literally, because it's all screen capture. And they could always hire somebody to do the uh, the green screen or whatever it is, like what they do CGI for with Ruffalo or with Tatiana Maslany. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of listeners and viewers of the She-Hulk movie will know is that there's a very tall woman that is out there that stands in as double for She-Hulk for uh, Tatiana Maslany. You've seen that online too, right, Steve? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, repost- I reposted that on the Panels to Pixels Facebook page. That, yeah, they I saw that, that. picture of her. with the- and, that's, and that's a comment that I heard one of the, another podcast did make that, you know, the, the reason they have that is because the actors will then have a, have a sight line of when they're talking to She-Hulk. Because yes. obviously they're not going to be looking at her knees. They're going to be looking up at her. And so that gives the actors that that kind of sight line. And that was one of the, I think it was Greg or somebody mentioned the fact that they thought it was really great with how the actors were able to interact with the CGI she, uh, She-Hulk. Yeah, which I think is amazing too, because yeah, you're giving people extremely tall people at this point, because that woman has to be at least 6'4". <laughs> and we know that She-Hulk is at least 6'7". So she has the height. And mm-hmm. I and when you see Tatiana Maslany and her standing next to each other in yeah. the kitchen in that it picture, it's it's like a huge difference in height. Yeah. But uh yeah, that that's the only thing I had really for news other than that, you know, we'll be covering Werewolf by Night. All right. The only podcast recommendation I have this week is I just listened to it was actually an interview from September on Rob Lowe's podcast, literally mm-hmm. with Rob Lowe. He interviewed Ice T. Huh. And I highly recommend going out. Even if you don't subscribe to Literally with Rob Lowe, uh, go out and download that interview. And because Ice T, it's just fascinating to hear him talk about the beginnings of hip hop and rap and awesome. where that all came from. And then talks a little bit about being on. In fact, he's he's played a cop for twenty years. You know, <laughs> he had a he had a song about killing cops many many years ago, and now he's <laughs> the beloved cop character. Uh, on on Law and Order SVU, so it's it's a really cool conversation. It's only about an hour long, which is all that's what Rob Lowe usually stays to is right around the fifty five minute to an hour mark. But yeah, literally with Rob Lowe interview with Ice T. Awesome. 
Well, I don't have any podcast recommendations, but I do have a YouTube recommendation, and it's our friends Michael and Jessica from the Grim Life Collective. Now, they were in my neck of the woods this past weekend, and they went to go see, uh, because Halloween is upon us, everybody. So uh, they went to what we have in Ulster County in, in that area called the Headless Horseman, and it used to be a hayride. Now, they stopped the hayrides about three years ago, I'm uh, from what I'm told. Uh, now it's all walking thing, so you have to walk through everything, but mm. uh, it, it's a good hour and a half haunted mansion kind of thing. It's all outside, but you have some interiors. You have a haunted motel. You got a slaughterhouse. You got a corn maze that you could go through, a whole bunch of other uh, venues that they, they have that you could walk through, but people scare the living daylights out of you. And it's uh, rated one of the th three best haunted attractions during Halloween in, the, in America. And uh, I've gone there a bunch of times, but I haven't been able to go there. I haven't gone since just before COVID. Uh, originally, tickets used to be about like 55 bucks. I think the, the prices have gone up, but they put more into it this year. And Jessica and Michael were able to do a, uh, a whole video of it. So you can see that on, on YouTube. So if you go to the Grim Life Collective and check that out and look for um, Headless Horseman and you'll see it and they have, it's a good, almost an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. And they were able to get video, which you never were able to do at this place at all because of actors and, you know, licensing and everything else. But in this case, they were able to do it. So if you're interested in going to it, I highly recommend it. If you could get out here into New York and to Ulster County and check out the Headless Horseman. It, like I said, it might be a little bit pricey per person, but it is well worth it for the scares, especially during Halloween. So check that out, Grim Life Collective and the Headless Horseman episode. Cool. Yeah. Well, obviously, you're listening to us on your podcast player of choice, whether that be uh, Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. We would love to uh, get a review from you on that. Uh, if we get shout out, we would shout you out here on the podcast if we uh, get a chance to see that review. Uh, so we are on all the platforms that are about there. Just search for Panels to Pixels Podcast. And you can check out our website would be Panels to Pixels Podcast.com. We're on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Panels to Pixels. We are on Twitter at Panels2Pixels, so that's at and Panels and the number two, Pixels. We have an email address, which is Panels2Pixels1 at gmail.com. That's Panels2Pixels1. The T-O is spelled out right in the middle and the number one at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube if you search panels to pixels podcast while you're there. If you like what we do, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Like I always state, uh, there is some video there, so once we get another guest or somebody to interview, there will be video. So check that out when you can. Or if you like to listen to your podcast that way, they're there as well. We are on Instagram at panels 2 pixels podcast. That's words all spelled out, panels 2 pixels podcast on Instagram. And you can check out all the other podcasts on the Lex Level Podcast Network. We highly recommend them all. Uh, Wilhelm, The Melting Pat, Podcast Zero, and so much more. All you have to do is go to nextlevelradioonline.com and check them out there. If you listen to the most recent version of Wilhelm, or the new episode, because uh, Ben is back, and Steve and I are on that particular episode when we cover Community. Absolutely. So coming up for us uh, in the future, you'll get more of the Umbrella Academy Season 3, Werewolf by Night, and whatever else comes down the pipe. You never know. Exactly. I I'm thinking I'm playing with the idea of doing Paper Girls. Oh, yeah. I've already watched that one, but uh, yeah, I want to get confirmation there's a Season 2 coming. But, uh, <laughs> it's it's it, it was good. I I'd be excited to watch it again. Yeah, I'm, I highly recommend it. Our friend Jamie is interested, too, because she was like, oh, wait, they did that? <laughs> she didn't know. Oh, there you go. So, uh, well, with that, where can where else can listeners hear us? Well, for me, I send in voicemails to various podcasts that our friends do, and they play them often on there as feedback. So you hear my voice on a lot of different places. Exactly. And, of course, right here on Panels Division Podcast. And, of course, next week, probably by the time you this comes out, Wilhelm will have already come out as mark just stated that uh, we're on there talking about community exactly and uh well you listeners could hear me 
right here on Panels to Pixels podcast, but also you could hear me on Adrenaline Cinema podcast on the Pyrocore Entertainment Network. And there, uh, up recently will be Speed from 1994 with our friend Kelly. And we discuss that whole movie thoroughly and have fun with it. You could also hear me on Fantasy Picks Movie Edition. That could also be found on the Pyrocore Entertainment Network. We'll be covering, of all things, The Mummy 2017. And how we could change that particular movie. Ben stated that we could get rid of Tom Cruise altogether. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, honestly, there's other things that we could possibly do with either script, music, storyline, things of that nature. So check that out. You can hear Rob, Joe, myself, Ralph, and Zach talk about The Mummy from 2017. You could also hear me, uh, Jamie and I, I already mentioned Jamie. Our friend Jamie and I cover Sandman cast on the Podcastica Network. We're coming to a, an end with the extra episode, which it's a two-parter and it's animated. So you could hear me, Jamie, and I think possibly Lara, and we're going to cover that. And that will be finishing up Sandman cast and the Sandman I think series I on Netflix. I voice that also. Yep. So, it's a short one. But yeah, you could hear us there. But, uh, yeah, pretty much uh, that's it for this particular episode of Panels to Pixels. Well, I just want to say, same podcast, different panel, different pixel. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this was Panels to Pixels Podcast, and we'll see you on the next panel. Good night. Good night. Do I have to do that again? <laughs> <laughs>